pay attention to what's the flavor coming in and then what is the flavor as your mouth is closed and you're slowly breathing out through your nose you can get so much more of an experience of wine if you're paying attention to that you get more of an expression of the retronasal flavor when you have those secondary and tertiary characters of an older wine opening up that really builds the retronasal in a big way especially with your tobacco and your leather and things like that or sometimes microbiologically you can get flavors that come up that way so if the wine has a little bit of Britannomyces a little bit of that horsey sort of band-aidy character it can be a very nice component of wine but you don't necessarily smell and feel so much of that up front but in that retronasal experience you really can have that evolution of those secondary flavors those microbial flavors a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 174. How can tuning into the retronasal aspect of smell take your wine tasting skills to the next level? What makes the sense of smell so fascinating? What does it mean to be a virtual brand? And what do grapes and M&Ms, that's the candy, have in common? You'll hear those stories and more during part two of our chat with Jim Duane, host of the Inside Winemaking Podcast. You don't need to have listened to part one from last week, but I hope you'll go back if you missed it after you finish this one. Now on a personal note, before we dive into the show with the continuing story of publishing my new wine memoir. The job of a book title is to entice a potential reader to pull the book off the shelf in a store or click on it online. When my publisher suggested Red, White, and Drunk All Over for my first book, I was appalled. (laughs) I thought, no one's going to buy a book with that title, and I'll be laughed out of wine writing circles. But as we discussed it, I came to understand that a title has to stand out from millions of books published each year so bland and safe doesn't cut it. It also has to encapsulate what the book is about. The subtitle is like best supporting actor in amplifying it. The subtitle was A Wine-Soaked Journey from Grape to Glass. My second book had a much less provocative title, Unquenchable, with the subtitle A Tipsy Search for the World's Best Bargain Wines. The book did well, but not as well as the first one and I believe the title played a role in that, among other factors. The original title of my memoir was The Wine Witch Must Burn, with the subtitle How I Rose from the Ashes of Divorce, Depression, and Defamation Without Becoming an Alcoholic. It's since morphed into Wine Witch on Fire, with the subtitle Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Depression, and Drunk All Over. I like the implied strength of Wine Witch on Fire, which also feels as though it has more agency than The Wine Witch Must Burn. This is still a working title, and ultimately the publisher's sales and marketing teams will decide on the final title and subtitle because they need to be confident they can sell the memoir to book retailers. The title is an important part of the package. I'd love to hear what you think of this title and subtitle, and potentially if you have a better one to suggest. In the meantime, I'm going to start sharing some beta reader reviews of the memoir, beginning with this one from Rochelle in Ottawa. Quote, I quite liked her highlighting life's roller coaster of emotions, highs and lows. A person, a place, a smell is often memorable or unforgettable. Her words spoke to me. I can really feel the emotions. We've all been there at one time or another, questioning, women innately turning inward, thinking we must have done something wrong to contribute to the collapse. I didn't want to put this book down. 
Natalie, you made me laugh. You have such a way with words that truly depicts your exact feeling in the moment. I am sure so many reading will feel the same. If you enjoyed Through the Garden by Lorna Crozier or No More Nice Girls by Lauren McEwen, you'll enjoy this book. I've posted a link to a blog post called Diary of a Book Launch in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 174, and this is where I'll share more behind-the-scenes stories with you about the journey of taking this memoir from idea to publication. If you want a more intimate insider seat beside me on this journey, please let me know that you'd like to become a beta reader and get a sneak peek at the manuscript. Email me at natalie at nataliemclean.com. You can also let me know if you've got a better title for the book. In the show notes, you'll also find my email contact, the full transcript of my conversation with Jim, links to his website and podcast, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 174. Okay, on with the show. Now, let's go back to your podcast. You've talked about why you started it, because you wanted a resource that you couldn't find yourself. So who's the target audience for your podcast? I didn't know at first, to be honest, Natalie. So when I took this job in 2011 at CV, I'm here alone. I have two harvest interns during harvest, but outside of the year... I'm alone and I'm working in a cave. So I like to joke when people come to visit, but I do spend six months of the year by myself in a windowless cave. <laughs> so it's a bit of a hermit job, which kind of suits my personality because I get to go to the vineyard and work in the cellar and sort of get all my introvertedness out of my system. But I was longing for the technical interaction that I had at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars because when I left Stag's Leap, they had been purchased and it was a joint venture between the Antonori family out of Italy and the St. Michelle Wine Estates Group out of Washington State. And so we were having the the enologist from the Antonori whole conglomerate come to work with us and blend with us three or four times a year. We had winemakers from all the various brands in Washington and Oregon coming down, and there was this nexus of like technical information. And I I loved it. It was one of the greatest benefits of that job. I learned so much just from these other people's experiences and their, their willingness to share. So then I took this job at CB and I was alone and I got cut off of that. And so I, part of the reason for starting the podcast was to increase my network and to build that technical sort of connection that I had been longing for. You know, I could ask a winemaker to coffee and they'd answer a few questions for five minutes. But the podcast was really a way for me to leverage, to get people to sit down, take it more seriously And then have that long form conversation where I get to ask all those questions that I wanted to ask, not just like the top throwaway ones, but the hard ones. And then like you do, Natalie, like stop people when you're not satisfied with the answer and and dig in more. I love this. It gives us an excuse to get nosy. And like I ask questions, you know, I could never do just as you say over coffee or dinner. I'd just be monopolizing a person too. If I just, <laughs> and what about this? And what about that? It's like, uh, you wouldn't okay. get invited back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A bit obsessive, <laughs> but you're right. I love that long form conversation. It's far more satisfying to me. It's the audio equivalent of writing a book. There's nothing like it. Like there's no satisfaction to me in Facebook videos. It's just like people pay attention for 30 seconds and then they're off. But this I can tell the listeners are involved, they stay, and they, most people listen to 90 plus percent of the episodes, even when they're long. It's, it's, I love it. Super cool. Yeah. But I didn't is. answer your question, the target audience was, and, and that's because I didn't know who it was. So I made these episodes like a podcast, you know, I just put them on all the platforms and so they're, they're free. And so whoever wants to listen can listen. And over time, I've come to learn that like there's a segment of the audience that is in the industry, you know, especially in the West Coast. So there's a segment that's wine industry and they're listening to their friends or they're just interested because they're interested in wine making. There's a small segment that's like the sommelier, you know, the crowd that's working in wine sales and marketing and things like that are just interested in learning about wine. But that's not really my main audience. A big part of the audience now are aspirational winemakers. So people, especially outside of California, that are interested in starting their own brands, which is really starting to become a big thing in the U.S. There was sort of this big boom of breweries over the past 20 years, microbreweries, and now wineries are starting to have their own thing. And it's 
not necessarily a great opportunity if you're going to try to do that in Napa or California. But if you're in Iowa and you have a local crowd, a loyal audience, or all these other states that don't have a lot of wine industry where it's unique and you can make a nice wine, those opportunities are really out there. And I'm so excited that I get connected to a lot of those people. They're wanting to learn about wine. They're not going to go back to school. They don't have the time or the money, or they're just at a point in their life where they're not going to do that. So a lot of them want to listen to the podcast because they want the practical know-how as fast as they can get it so they can be successful in their own work. Absolutely. Oh, so many parallels. Like I've been binge listening to publishing podcasts because I'm going into publishing my third book. And it's such a great way to learn. Like you can be multitasking and still learning. But yeah, I can imagine because, you know, with wineries, I think as wine consumers, we love the small, unique, artisanal, local story. So your podcast and the information that you've got on it fits right into that for people who are aspiring to be winemakers. I think it's just, it's a great target for you. Natalie, I got to know, how stressful is it to write a book? It's not something that I think I could ever take on, but you've done this before. You're doing it again. How much work is it? It's a lot. <laughs> it's like fermenting Riesling. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the acid and the uh, sugar. It's got to balance the humor and the dark to keep people's interest. But yeah, no, I'm looking forward to talking on your podcast about this as well. But it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And my first two books were... Um, adventures along the wine route, like Kermit Lynch really inspired me. And I would go visit winemakers and get their stories and maybe even help out with the harvest or do whatever to get deeper insights. The third book I'm working on though, is a wine memoir. And it's more about being a woman in the wine industry now for 20 years. And wine is definitely a part of it, but it's a much different animal from the first two books. So yeah, it takes all of you. I mean, it takes every ounce of you, all of your emotional energy, all of your mental effort and physically as well. So yeah, it's everything. I'm sure there are many, many parallels to making wine. And I got to ask just for my own issues, is it going to be an audio book? Can I listen to this? Yes. Okay. I'm awesome. audio first too, Jim. That's why one of the reasons I started podcast because I would fall asleep reading books or my eyes would dry out or whatever. And maybe it's a childhood thing of listening to my mother read to me at night, but <laughs> I love listening to books. And I finally come around to the fact that it is real reading to <laughs> listen to a book. And so, yeah, for sure. Like we just negotiated the deal with my publisher and because they weren't going to exploit audio rights right away, we kept the audio rights and now we're going to market that to audio only companies like Brilliance or Audible or whatever. So definitely audio will come out with the book. And are you going to do the audio? You're going to read it? I want to. Yes. Okay. I hope you do. Well, thank you. I mean, it makes sense because I have a podcast. I did the audio version of my first book, Red, White and Drunk All Over. So now I got to do the second one. But this one, I definitely want to do it on launch, like not after the fact. Yeah, will people recognize your voice? Now? Exactly. And I think, especially for a memoir, I know where to cry and where to laugh. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be very dramatic. <laughs> anyway, we should get back to you, Jim. <laughs> so you're teaching classes as well, and that came as a direct result of your podcast. How did that happen? Did people wanted more from you or how did that take place? Yeah. So I started the podcast in 2014. It was really a slow start. I, I kind of realized I had to build up a catalog of episodes before it was really going to be a, a real resource for anyone. I'm, the main podcasts I do are interview style, much like, like yours. There was some pressure. I was getting feedback by email, you know, people asking questions and wanting sort of topical conversations. And so I've done a couple of episodes on like sugar and alcohol and winemaking or pH and TA, some real sort of technical deep dives. And I honestly, I loathe doing them. It's like having to do a book report for me. It's like going back to school and the worst part, all the anxiety of writing, and it's not what I enjoy doing. So finally, I kind of found a way where instead of me having to do it, I would bring in people that were good at that, have certain skills and you know technical skills. And just pepper them with questions and make them kind of do the teaching just by me sort of queuing them up with questions. But over time, I had this just mountain of information and questions by email. And finally, at some point, people on the street would say, oh, I actually I listened to your podcast. And it was kind of shocking at first, but they would give me feedback. And at some point, I was like, there's a lot of people out there I finally recognized that, that want to learn winemaking, 
a lot of my audience does the UC Davis online certificate program in winemaking. It's a great course for people that don't have as, as much time or they're remote, but it's expensive. And so I thought, well, okay, maybe I can offer some sort of class that's going to be really focused on the practical. We're not drawing structures of anthocyanins or any of this technical stuff that honestly the day-to-day winemaker doesn't need to know. Like I was hoping to just sort of synthesize, like how could we teach, how could I teach winemaking in just the most practical way in, in one or three days as possible. And I had this idea to do this class. And so in 2017, I just put it out there. I said, okay, I'm going to do this class in August in Napa in person. It's going to be three days. If you want to come, we're going to go to vineyards. We're going to go to wineries. We're going to go to labs. We start at a cooperage. So we actually go to the cooperage where they're, you know, at eight in the morning, they've got their fires because they're toasting all the barrels. And it's just like this exciting way to start the day and get to see this real craft. And we just happen to be lucky because in Napa, there are two cooperages that are working full out right before harvest. And I thought, we'll see if anyone wants to come. If no one wants to come, it's not a thing. And I've got a small group of people. I got, I think, eight people, which is what I can fit in a sprinter van. And we did this three-day course and people loved it. I had a good time. I'm not an event planner. So the hardest part for me was just getting the lunches and the dinners and all that sorted out. But to this day, we do this. I have this class called Deep Winemaking, which I run every year in early August, three days. And it's 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. vineyards and wineries and cooperages. And then we do a blind tasting. And I just try to pack as much winemaking as I can into three days. And so it's a lot of people coming from all over the U.S. And it's less and less California these days. And then people are going back to their wineries that they're building in Georgia and South Carolina and Indiana. And so for me, it's been a lot of fun and it's exciting to help people make wine. Oh, that's great. Do you ever get any Canadians or people from other countries? Yeah, I've had a couple people from Switzerland and there's someone coming from Canada this August. Um, it's starting to grow little by little. Are you fully booked yet? I am. Yeah, sold oh, out in a wow. day. Uh, okay, so you got to sign up in advance, well in advance. Yeah, I'm going to do a one day winemaking harvest prep course, I think, in August as well. But I have to balance my life and it could potentially be a drought year this year. And so we could be pulling in grapes in, in mid-August this year. So got to make sure I'm not double booking myself with harvest. Sure. And all those daughters with all those teeth, who knows what <laughs> might happen. <laughs> At some point, all the teeth got to fall out, right? Oh, Isn't that's that true. Then logical? they start on root canals. No, God forbid <laughs> that they don't have to do that. Ugh. Did you teach winemaking in a prison or have I got that mixed up? Oh, no. I, I learned winemaking from... Uh, Russell, the guy that I was telling you about in New Zealand that put the Pinot Noir on the parking lot, Russell spent a lot of his time in various prisons in New oh, Zealand. Okay. So he was a tough dude. He was a very tough dude. And yeah, he explained to me how to smuggle prostitutes into his minimum security prison at one point. Like he would just talk, like he never stopped talking. And I just, <laughs> you know, I would do my Sauvignon Blanc and try and focus on that. He explained to me that he knew how to make wine because he'd spent so much time in prison that he knew how to make hooch in the ceiling above his cell. Because he wasn't like a scary criminal. He'd done a lot of, you know, DUIs and things like that. And so he'd been in minimum security prison, but he would learn to save all of his fruit. All the guys would save their fruit and put it in a bucket and hide it in the ceiling. And he was explaining to me that like, he knew all about fermentation because he'd done this for years before. And oranges were the best thing to ferment. I remember him saying that too. Oh, wow. Okay. But I've tried to stay out of prison. That's not really conducive yeah, no. to my lifestyle. He probably taught you that too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Have you had a favorite guest on your podcast? No. I mean, I was excited to get Dave Finney. I think I, he was on the podcast back in 2015 or 2016. Dave's the guy that started Prisoner, the brand The Prisoner, and then sold that off to Huneus and then started Oren Swift. And that's become a big program that got sold off to Gallo a couple of years ago. He also started the locations brand. If you've ever seen the wine bottles that have the country flag on them. And so he's just been this successful serial entrepreneur. He's a guy that doesn't have a technical background in winemaking, but I got him on the, I was able to get him on the podcast in 2016, sat down in his office. He had a John Deere hat on. And the first thing he said to me is what's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, okay. I mean, he's a guy that doesn't have a computer, doesn't use email. Everything's on the phone. Very successful. So I was really excited to have him on the podcast. He was super cool. And then 
Years later, my brother does some of my website metrics because that's kind of his world. And he goes, do you know that 50% of the people coming to your website are just searching for Dave Finney? That one page, that one episode is is responsible for 50% of your web traffic. Oh my goodness. I had no idea. That's great. Yeah, he was probably the the biggest... I don't know. I'm not really going after celebrities and celebrity winemakers. There's, I think other people do that very well. I'm, I'm more interested in, in real technical stuff and people that people might not necessarily know about. Sure. Sure. Sounds interesting. Well, we should taste your wines, or I, I oh, would like you to okay. <laughs> taste through for us. You've got two wines there today. They're both terranium. Territorium. Oh, territorium. <laughs> terranium. That's okay. We're, That's uh, where you we're keep spiders, that right? Yeah. <laughs> A lot of uh, uh, terrarium. <laughs> the yeah. earth, yes. So territorium Ter- is a word that was kind of born out of the word terroir. And so we're very interested in exploring different places. So we're not making wines from Napa and Sonoma, but we're really looking for value sites outside of the major wine growing regions. So this is a rosé of Grenache. Yeah. We'll get these in the show notes, linked in the show notes as well. But yeah. Okay, and great. And one of the things we're excited about in label design is we have what we call these emojis on the back. And so for every wine, we have four flavor emojis that kind of describe what is in the wine. So for this rosé, it's grapefruits, lemongrass, strawberry, and cucumber. And those emojis and their color are reflective of the colors on the front label there. We just really wanted to show to the customer what's going to be inside. We want people to have a good idea of what the wine is and, and not be obscure. Sure. I'd love you to describe, those are obviously the aromas, but the one thing you mentioned was maybe as you're tasting, how you use the ornonasal and the retronasal? Sure. So a lot of people know about, they think of smelling the wine and they think of, of breathing in, and that's your just normal way of smelling. And a lot of people don't know about the retronasal aspect to smelling. And so as you breathe in and you're taking all those flavors, you get a certain experience of the wine. But You may not necessarily know this because you've ever thought about it, but everyone knows that when you're eating, you do get flavor that comes up, especially through your nose. If your mouth is closed, you get that retronasal lift of flavor. And so I really try and pay attention to what's the flavor coming in and then what is the flavor as your mouth is closed and you're slowly breathing out through your nose, you can get so much more of an experience of wine if you're paying attention to that. And really you get more of an expression of the retronasal flavor when you have those secondary and tertiary characters of an older wine opening up, that really builds the retronasal in a big way, especially with your tobacco and your leather and things like that. Or sometimes microbiologically, you can get flavors that come up that way. So if the wine has a little bit of Britannomyces, a little bit of that horsey sort of band-aidy character, it can be a very nice component of wine, but you don't necessarily smell and feel so much of that, so much of that up front. But in that retronasal experience, you really can have that that evolution of those secondary flavors, those microbial flavors. I've been really on a kick of wines from Brunello de Montalcino. They just have a lot of flavor that takes a little bit of investigation. It takes like you get some, some pretty fruit and some earth up front, some spice. But if you slow down, and it does help if you're eating. But if you slow down and pay attention to the wine as it's like it's in the back of your your nasal cavity in the back of your mouth, doesn't sound very sexy to put it that way. But if you just pay attention to the wine, wines often have a lot more to give than just what's up front. Yeah, like people. Um, (laughs) That's that's a good point. Is it because once you get the wine in your mouth, you're heating it up, it's becoming more volatile. So you're going to get those molecules moving faster or are there more taste buds back there? Why is that? Why do you get so much out of the retronasal? That's a good question. I don't know if I know all the answers, but I think warming it up certainly is key. So especially if you have chilled white wine or rosé, like you can't taste as much when a wine is really cold. You're really going to feel the acidity or the sweetness or the tannins a lot more. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons why you don't want to have a big Cabernet or a big tannic wine cold because it really feels hard and astringent. So yeah, you're, you're warming those molecules up. They're moving more. So you're getting some more volatilization. But also I think there's just, I think you're accessing different flavor receptors in a different part of your sort of orthonasal cavity that just maybe are more sensitive. I don't know the science of it. I've been more of just a sort of a a lover or someone who's been trying to pay attention to that. But I think the whole science of scent is like, that's to me is very fascinating. It's the one sense that we don't have a 
full knowledge of how it works. We know vision and touch and taste very well, but scent is still very much a mystery for the most part. Yeah, it's almost ancient and we've left it undeveloped where I've heard that we take in 80 to 90% of information visually, but our noses are so powerful if we just pay attention to what's going on. If you've ever uh, had a chance, again, I hardly read books because like you, I struggle to read books, but there's a book called The Emperor of Scent. Oh, yes. Have you read this one? I think it's Chandler Burr. Is that the perfume? Yeah, it's very much about perfume. Yes. But it's an exploration of what we know or perhaps really what we don't know about how biologically our sense of smell works. It's a really fascinating book. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, I'll have to look for that. And the other book I want to read is the latest one by Harold McGee, the science food writer. The book is called Nosedive, and it's all about smell and sense. You might Ooh, okay. actually I'm like to- write that one down. You, what was the author? Harold McGee? Harold McGee. So he's written a lot of food and science books, but his latest one is all about scent and smell. And of course, he talks about wine. He's more known for food but he would be a great guest. I, we both have to get him on our respective shows. <laughs> so whoever gets him first, share an email address, please. All right, um, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it'd be great. Can I share one quick story about this rosé? Yes, this was, please. This was a special wine for us. So Territorium launched in 2021. This is a brand that came out of the first winemaking class that I had in Napa in 2017. A couple of the guys, Ben Matthews and Cameron Laurent, were on this class and then went back to their lives and their their jobs and you know had it in the back of their head that they wanted to start a brand. Individually, they had that. And then they came together to make this partnership. And, and originally, Territorium was going to be a an urban winery in Cincinnati. And then as Ben was fundraising for that and getting close to it, the pandemic hit. And so I came on as a partner to help with sourcing of grapes and wines and that sort of technical stuff. But then the whole brand had to shift to a virtual brand. So we launched a couple of wines back in April. So we're just a virtual brand. We don't have a, a winery or a tasting room. The wines are made in Sonoma and in Napa. But 2021 was the first year we made wines from grapes. And for this rosé, we got some, found these really nice Grenache grapes out in El Dorado, which is just at the, the base of the Sierra Hills on your, the foothills of the, the Sierra Mountains outside of Sacramento. But 2021 was a tough year because of the, the fires. I mean, every year is tough in some respect in California these days, but there was the Caldor fire that broke out in August, and this was just a couple miles away from Starfield Vineyard where we got these grapes. And because we were making rosé, we picked early, and so we were picking in August. And so I think they had a pick for some sparkling wine they were going to make off the property. Then we picked our rosé, and then after that, all of the crop was lost because of, of smoke damage. So our heart goes out to them because they lost all their crop. They, I think they had crop insurance, which is a big deal for anyone producing wine in California these days. But it was kind of nice that just by luck of us picking early, we were able to, to get some crop off that vineyard and we're able to, you know, give them some money for so their season wasn't a complete loss in terms of growing grapes that were going to be made into wine. But two days later, we wouldn't have been able to pick these grapes. So we got lucky. Wow. Yeah, that's a new twist. Usually I hear from winemakers that they pick between the raindrops, but you pick just in time before the fires. That, yeah, that's a big deal. And what would you pair this rosé with? A swimming pool. Ah, I love <laughs> I it. Think, I think swimming pools are great. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you're not eating the swimming pool and hopefully you're not drinking the water. But <laughs> with rosé, I love salt. I love popcorn. So having um, like a truffle popcorn is great. Potato chips are always a great combination with rosé. And then my favorite, and I give credit to my friend, Chris Krajani, who's a winemaker at Bouchain Vineyards in Napa. She came up with the idea for crab nachos. Oh. So nachos doesn't sound real high class, but you throw a little bit of crab meat on top and you can make your nachos a little fancier. That rosé is my absolute favorite pairing. Oh, lovely. I do always love pink wine and pink food. So any like <laughs> lobster and rosé or crab, you know, I think they go so beautifully together. In building rosé, it's got to be bright, right? It's got to be not searing with acidity, but it's, it's got to make you want to salivate and got to be drinking it when it's warm. And so you're going to have the high acidity to cut through some of that fat or the salt that you're going to have with the, the food. Sure. Absolutely. And what is the other wine that you have there? Also Territorium? Let me grab this here. This is the Territorium Cabernet Franc. So this is 2018. 
So in, in order to launch the brand in time for 2021, we had to go out and source some wines in bulk. And fortunately, I have a lot of connections through some great producers, and we were able to find just a few barrels of wines that we really liked. So this is from Alexander Valley, which is part of Sonoma. It's actually just kind of due north of Napa. But with Territorium, we didn't want to necessarily make the, the everyday wines like the Cabernet Sauvignon. We wanted to be a little bit more interesting. And so Cabernet Franc was a, it's a flavor profile where... Unlike Cabernet Sauvignon, or like if you sort of compare the two, you dial back the fruit a little bit and you get more earth in Cabernet Franc. Uh, and so we were just really excited about that varietal. And so 2018, we produced this wine. You can see the front label here on the, the back. The flavor emojis here are, uh, what are we? Clove, wildflowers, dried herbs, and baking spices, which is really does justice to what the wine is. There's fruit to this wine, but it's really about herbs and spice. And that's the one thing that we were all excited about with Cabernet Franc, with those that profile. Yeah. We love Cab Franc in Canada too. It's just so interesting in terms of the aroma profile. So when you are picking these grapes for evaluation, I heard you describe it as interesting because you were talking about it being more of a texture thing than a taste thing. I'm sure taste matters too, but you're even comparing them to cracking open an M&M or something. What, what are you doing when you're testing these grapes in the vineyard to see if they're ready to pick or not? You're absolutely right that the texture is the guide for picking grapes. And I should back up and say, like, I think when you pick your grapes is the single most important winemaking decision that you can make in terms of style, in terms of everything that cascades down from your pick decision, because you're really choosing your, your level of ripeness your acidity, your potential alcohol, your flavor profile. But that texture is really key because this is maybe more specific to, to red grapes and red wine than, than white wines, but the tannins that are in the skin are what you have to extract into the wine. And so you have to think about the quality of those tannins and the, the quantity of those tannins. And as grapes ripen, they go through verasion, they change from green to red. As they're early in the ripening, so this is you know end of July, early August, before grapes are fully ripe, if you were to chew the skins of those red grapes, they're horribly astringent. You know, some varieties, big ten varieties more so than other varieties, but like for the Cabernet that I tend to work with day to day, it's, it's very drying and astringent and unpleasant. And as the grapes ripen on the vine, in that sort of that runway all the way to your harvest date, those tannins are mellowing out. They're taking on this refinement. And there's a bunch of different chemical and processes that are happening in the grape itself to refine these tannins. And one of the reasons that people often, like in the old world, say you can you can watch for the birds. When the birds come and start eating in the grapes, that's when you know the, the grapes are ripe. We're kind of doing the same thing. We're just tasting the grapes every day. And at some point, they're going to start to not only taste good, don't necessarily taste great. There's a lot of sugar and there's not as much flavor as you taste ultimately in the wine. But that texture is something that you can really feel. And you can feel that evolution from coarseness to something more of a, an elegance and refinement. And so there's this analogy that came down from Michael Salati, who's the winemaker at Opus One. So he had been a winemaker at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. And so he was kind of my mentor's mentor. And this is one of those stories that sort of came down through that mentorship. But... Everyone knows what an M&M is like, where you pop it in your mouth and you have that hard candy outer shell. And then as you let it sit in your mouth and melt, eventually you get to the milk chocolate. And that texture, as that you hit the milk chocolate and it spreads across your tongue and through your mouth, it's a very soft, elegant milk chocolate texture. That's kind of the goal. If we can get to that texture, that's a cue that we can pick grapes. Now, Cabernet is not exactly ever going to get there. It's not going to get that soft and that plush, especially not on hillside vineyards that I'm working with. But as we're getting close to that texture, and I kind of know through experience, like once there's a hint of it, it's time to pick because now those tannins from those grapes, that's what you're going to be extracting in the cellar into your wine. And ultimately people are going to be, whether they're thinking about it like at the forefront of their brain or not, they're going to be filling this texture. There's a weight of the wine, but then those tannins, if it's very tight and drying, that can work for a certain style of wine or for certain cuisine. But if you have big tannins, if you have a lot of tannin, then you need the quality of that tannin to have some elegance. So I often think of the vintages that I produce at CV as this balance between 
elegance and power. And certain vintages skew more towards one or the other, kind of really depending on the growing season and the conditions at harvest. Wow, that is a great way to put it. Really helpful way to understand it, those metaphors. And the best way to do it is, is you ever get a chance, go out and taste grapes. I mean, it's it's one thing to listen to it, but like there's no special tools that a winemaker has in their mouth. It's just the ability to pay attention, to feel what's in your mouth. Yeah, absolutely. What would you pair with this wine, your Cab Franc? Oh, okay. So this is a bigger wine. So we have, like you said, there's Cabernet Franc grown in a lot of places throughout the U.S., Canada, different places in France, obviously. And so Cabernet Franc is is a very malleable varietal. You can take it from like a low ripeness to very high ripeness. And for us being in California, being in Sonoma and Alexander Valley, we're going to get a real ripeness to it. It's not going to be like a Chenon from France. It's going to be, you know, a more dense wine. So it's a pretty big wine, got some fruit, but again, a lot of earth and a lot of spice. And so I try to keep that in mind when pairing. So I've done lamb chops. That's probably my favorite with like a garlic rosemary sauce or just, you know, like an oil in garlic and rosemary. Tried seafood. I'm still trying to figure out like what's the best seafood for Cabernet Franc. Salmon can work okay, but I think other whitefish might be better. But big red meats do really well with this wine because it is a big wine with a lot of flavor. Huh. That's great. That surprises me that white fish or I know salmon is a meaty fish. Mm -hmm. But I think if you get into like a fish with a lot of flavor, not necessarily fishy flavor, but more of like your not flaky fish, but your uh, I'm trying to think of. Not cod, but um, what's the one from South America? Oh, it's escaping me. I apologize. But um, if you have a robust sort of big favored fish, I think that works really well with the, the earthiness of cap rock. Huh. Interesting. Cool. And I imagine it would also depend on how you prepared it, if you had spices or sauces or whatever. Yeah. Cool. Oh my God. I can't believe how fast this time's going. This is such a great conversation, but I want to ask you some quick lightning round questions. Do you have a favorite childhood food that you pair with wine today? Pizza. Oh, pizza. <laughs> of course. Classic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I love cheese. Ah, there you go. All right. I don't like the idea of uh, people sort of diminishing a wine saying, oh, that's a pizza wine. To me, like I, I'll bring out some of the best wines with pizza because sure. you can make yeah. pizza very nice and fat goes really well with certain wines. Absolutely. If you could share a bottle of wine with anyone living or dead, who would that be? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, probably Andre Chalachev. He was a winemaker in California, in Napa, from, I think he was a winemaker at Beaulieu Vineyard from the 30s up until the 60s. He was a Russian emigre, and he, he went to the Louis Pasteur Institute in France, and he is the man, the, this technical person who is most responsible for bringing California winemaking out of the darkness of prohibition and really bringing technical winemaking back into wineries. And so he was so influential and to many of the mentors that have ultimately mentored me. So I like, I feel some sort of connection to him. He's, you know, he's passed away, but his influence on California winemaking is monumental. Wow. What would you ask him? Oh, he understood, and he was working at Beaulieu Vineyard in a time where they didn't have resources. So it was kind of the premier winery and wine brand in Napa, in California, through that period, through the mid-century, the previous century. It was the most well-known, probably the most well-regarded. But he didn't have a tank. He could never get stainless steel tanks. He could just never get resources from the ownership. And so he was constantly working to do his best in a very limited capacity. I just want to ask him, like, what are your frustrations? And like, what do you think wines could be? Or if, if you could have all the resources in the world, what would you do? Because he made such great wines. And these are wines that like, especially like the 1968, the VV Georges Latour. It's known as one of the best wines in California from that vintage to this date. Like, he made such incredible wines in a kind of a tough situation. Wow. Well, it sounds like there's parallels. When vines are in a tough situation, they produce better wine. People produce better wine and actually write better books. <laughs> I think it keeps us all from getting lazy. And no yes, one needs exactly. to be lazy. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh, this has been great. Is there anything we haven't mentioned or covered that you'd like to mention now, Jim? 
I just mentioned that I'm here at CV Vineyard, and like I said, we're out in the forest, but we do take visitors. And so if anyone's coming to Napa, we'd be happy to host you here. We're, we're small, and so we do tastings by appointment only, but check us out. I know you're going to have all the, the links in the show notes, but if you're in Napa, come and visit. I'd love to say hi and, and show you the property. It really is a spectacular place. Other than that, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And of course, people can find Inside Winemaking wherever they're listening to this podcast. And what is the best website to check out for you? Yeah, just InsideWineMaking.com. It's kind of my hub for everything. Great. Well, Jim, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I've learned a lot today. I love it. And I'm sure we're going to get lots of great feedback on this. So I really appreciate you taking the time today. Oh, thanks. Oh, and I should mention uh, Territorium Wines, which is, that that's the website as well. So Territorium Wines. Okay, great. We'll look for that. No spiders, just wines. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. <laughs> anyway. No, it's okay. <laughs> All right. I'll say bye for now, Jim, and I look forward to chatting with you on your podcast. All right. This has been fun, Natalie. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Jim. Here are my takeaways. I enjoyed hearing about what winemaker wannabes and everyday wine drinkers can learn from Jim's podcast. Even if you don't want to become a winemaker, understanding the process can deepen your appreciation of what you're drinking. Two, the retronasal sense of smell is a game changer when it comes to detecting specific aromas in wine. It's a subset, of course, within the fascinating world of smell that we're going to continue to explore on this podcast in future episodes. Three, Jim's comparison of grapes with M&Ms I thought was really helpful in understanding texture and ripeness. And four, I was also interested in Jim's explanation of virtual wine brands and how they work and are different from, well, real, non-virtual wine brands. In the show notes, you'll find my email contact, a full transcript of my conversation with Jim, links to his podcast and website, and how you can join me on a free online wine and food pairing class. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 174. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, want to be a beta reader, or got a new title for my book at natalie at nataliemclean.com. You won't want to miss next week when I chat with James Atkinson, host of Drinking Adventures, a really fun and lively podcast out of Australia. In the meantime, if you missed episode 75, go back and take a listen. I chat with Niagara's vine laureate and winemaker, Klaus Reif. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Good wine, in my opinion, has the right balance, the harmony. I always compare like this to the city and orchestra. You have an amazing piano player. You have an amazing trumpet player or a drum player. But if they're out of tune, it's horrible. That's what I try to accomplish with the mind, no? To bring all elements together to play in harmony. That's a great analogy, Klaus, because even if they're in tune, but if the piano is dominating the whole orchestra, it's not as beautiful as it could be with all the elements in harmony. And you don't go, oh, there's that trombone again. Everything has to work together so that there's this greater sense of the whole or the piece of music or the wine than you would get with just a solo by one instrument. I like that. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines and stories we discussed. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a Grenache. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.